Welcome to uh, second provocation this year, which is Material Matters with Anna Gidman and Angela Connolly. And our uh, discussant tonight is Hubert Sokolowski. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, Hubert, Hubert is the discussant and he'll introduce the speakers and, and tonight's uh, um, provocation in a moment. Um, I just want to say uh, a really warm welcome to Anna, who's just joining us in the new year as a new member of staff. So it's really great to have you with us this evening. Hooray! Thank you very much, Dan. <laughs> you're, Thanks. You're popular. I'm <laughs> so, really excited. I'm really excited to be joining. It's really good to have you. So I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to hand over to Hubert, who's tonight's discussant, to introduce the speakers. Off you go, Hubert. You have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, so hi everyone, I'm a third year student and I'm the co-lead of the MSA Climate Action Group. Uh, this is a group uh, which is led by students and we focus on raising awareness between the interconnection of the built environment and um, and sustainability and, yeah, um, and the climate. Um, so today our, we got speaker Anna Gedman from the Liverpool University. And she's also an architect. And um, she will be mostly talking about uh, the uh, natural, uh, she's going to talk about uh, natural materials and going to introduce you to the ideas of it. And uh, yeah. And uh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Um, then we're going to also have Angela Connolly, who's going to discuss about. Uh, the ideas of concrete and how concrete is used. Um, so we're going to start off with uh, Anna Gedman, uh, who's going to present to you. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm really looking forward to the discussion and the presentation. Um, thanks, Hugh. That's great. Um, I'm just going to get going. Here we go. So um, the title of this provocation is how can we avert a climate crisis through the use of materials? Um, so I guess I'm thinking about the word positioning a lot with this because positioning is quite an interesting thing to me. Like where is your position in any argument in in your life and how we get through our lives um, through experiences and we all make choices and we make decisions based on that and we come up with a position. So um, I started working in an office where we did lots of education projects, sport projects. We I, I did an underground cinema, lots of uh, you know decadent use of um, oil-based uh, materials. I um, made lots of schools such as this one here, uh, but it always bothered me really because underneath um, this is the kind of stuff that I was specifying. So you can see cement board there, um, concrete on the floors, lots and lots of steel, and um, I didn't really kind of feel that it was right in my heart. So I started. Um, a little practice with my friend um, and we did small projects like this um, little bridge in uh, the Lake District. You can see how low the water is there but uh, when we remade this bridge that was collapsed um, they asked us to make it higher. Um, it's made out of steel but I still think it's um, it was a really appropriate and robust um, for the site because the timber one had rotted away um, and a week after we um, installed it this is this happened. <laughs> which I just think is just important to show you in terms of the fact that the climate change is really happening and the water level rose that much. We were a bit shocked, but it's a good job we did make it higher according to the Environment Agency. So um, I just think it's important to be aware of this kind of stuff when you're designing. Um, I'm also a member of the Architects Climate Action Network. The website link is there if you haven't been on it or haven't joined any of the groups yet. Um, the main three aims of the Architects Climate Action Network are decarbonise now, ecological re regeneration and cultural transformation. And uh, within the um, within ACAN, there are currently nine subgroups, um, all kind of developing out of the need to change the environment and action the climate crisis. I'm a member of the education group and the natural materials group. The one that I'm mostly interested in, I mean, I am a teacher, so I'm interested in education, but the one that I'm active in is the natural materials group. And part of ACAN is also um, stu 
students can. So if you're not a member of that yet, um, I really recommend that you join it. I know that your climate action group is um, part of that. So it would be really great if you got involved with your local one within the school. And um, all the events that um, we create um, are on the ACAN YouTube site. So that's a really good resource for looking at alternatives to traditional modern materials. Um, I've just included this slide because I think you might be interested in watching the video. The, the guy that uh, does the tour around this house is Lucas Demand. There's a photo of him down there. He's, he's brilliant. He goes around this house like he's doing a cook show with his arms everywhere, pointing out all this stuff in a really excited way. There are more than 100 um, bio-based materials in this house and it was built for Dutch Design Week in October. So, um, I mean, it would be an amazing thing to try and get that over to this country so we can have a look at it. But it's really worth having a look at that um, YouTube video to learn more about all the different materials that are available now and we're not using the traditional ones such as concrete. So natural, um, the Natural Materials Group um, aim is to make natural materials the first choice for building elements in construction. So going against um, typical steel and concrete and high energy materials. And uh, the definition that we've developed for natural materials as a group is materials that are abundant or renewable with minimal processing and therefore low embodied energy, materials that are healthy, non-toxic and part of a continuous life cycle, easily reused, recycled or returned to the earth. And then finally, materials that are sourced responsibly with minimal ecological damage and preferably part of a regenerative, regenerative land stewardship. So I just got a few questions really based on um, posters that we made um, this week for COP. Um, so the statement from ACAN is lime is breathable and airtight. And the question is, why do most of us use cement based plaster and render in our architecture? I'm not going to answer these questions. I just think that questions are really important. And the way that we learn is constantly questioning what we're thinking um, rather than just accepting the norm. Rammed earth has a 40th of the carbon footprint of concrete. So what stops us from building in rammed earth? There is enough waste straw in the UK to build 53,000 three bed homes every year. So why don't we make use of our waste? Hempcrete is better than zero carbon. And the question I'm putting to you is what should a wall look like? Sheep's wool is proven to neutralize harmful substances, regulate humidity and insulate thermally and acoustically. So what stops us from choosing wool to insulate when we have um, 23 million kilograms of wool a year and only half of it we keep in the country? Clay pasta is um, reversible and can be, is flexible and reworkable and it can be dyed with natural colors to avoid needing the use of paint. So clay pasta is expensive, however, but should we still be paying more for natural materials rather than going for the cheap ones that are full of energy? And then I think this is the last one. Um, mycelium can trap more heat than fiberglass insulation. It's fireproof, non-toxic and partly mold resistant. So why aren't we growing our insulation from waste? Because you can, you can actually grow it on waste material. So there's just some questions for you to consider when you're thinking about materials. Um, I thought I'd just show you very quickly with through um, a project that I um, did recently. Um, it's a tiny little chapel on this um, lake in Wales. It's called Capel Carmel. Capel is Welsh for chapel. Um, it's located there. And when uh, the client bought it, it looked like that, which was slightly terrifying for me because I really hadn't done anything like that before. If you think about the previous buildings that I showed you, which are huge and full of steel, but I really wanted to learn a lot from doing this project. So we, the first thing we did is we got a survey um, and we, it, which included all that land when they bought it, they got the land down to the lake. And um, the surveyors created these beautiful drawings for us of the existing chapel. A really nice section there. The, the, uh, the car shows you how tiny this chapel is. It's a really cute little building. And this is what it looked like when we visited um, the north and the west facades and then the south and the east. And you can see that there's some cement render that's been put on. We don't really know why it got put on, but it got put on two sides only, possibly to protect it from the wind or rain. I'm not really sure, um, but it's not really suitable for this type of building. Um, and inside it looked like this, 
Uh, we, we had to climb through the window because the door was, um, you, we couldn't get through the door. You can see the, the roof's fallen in on the door there. Um, and um, the client originally wanted to just fill the floor with concrete, stick in a load of oil-based rigid insulation in the roof and um, make some dividing walls using aluminium um, dry lining systems with plasterboard and um, cement plaster. So um, I managed to persuade them not to do that at all because it's a really nice old little building. It's half a meter thick walls and you can see by the people on the plan there how small it is. Um, so this is the plan that we um, developed, tiny little table and a, and a sofa and then a kitchen which is just four units in the middle with a shower room on one side and then a little study or bunk bedroom on the other side. Um, the doors were set back here so that they didn't open into the space and avoided hitting the windows and then we had some tiny little shelves just because there isn't really much store um, storage space. There is There was a shed here on the back of the chapel and this was going to be used for our um, heating and cooling and electrics and all of the all things related to plant rooms. And then above the kitchen and shower and bunk bed room, um, there's a deck, mezzanine deck with just a ladder to go up there. So that's what it looks like in section. And I'm going to talk to you a bit about the materials that we decided to use um, in a minute. You'll see it with photographs. But um, I think what's important to point out here is you see all these rafters that are coming down um, and you can see the the timber on top of the rafters, which you, you call it sarking board, but it's effectively like floorboards. Um, it's called sarking when it's in the roof. Um, they wanted that look from the inside, which meant that the insulation then had to go on the top of that. And then it made the roof super thick and we didn't want it to look thick from the outside. So this is the detail that I developed. So you can see here, this is the rafter coming down, hitting this stone wall. And then these little rectangles here are the sarking boards. And then we've got this really big thick layer of wood fiber insulation. So instead of using rigid insulation that's from oil based materials, um, it's wood fiber, which is based um, in um, with sawdust and it does have glue. So it's not it's not 100 percent amazing um, because it's got to have something to bind it. But the, the mass is mostly timber and um, you can then just drill into it. You can walk all over it. It's really strong. And then we put the um, battens and counter battens and then the slates on the top. And then you can see here at the end, you see this piece of timber is there's another bit attached here and then another one poking out. So the roof only looks thin from the outside. I was quite pleased with that detail. And then um, the floor, another um, alternative to the concrete that we used in the floor was this here, this big thick zigzag bit is recycled foam glass insulation. Um, some people don't think we should use that because um, we're melting, it's basically recycled glass melted and I think they must bubble some gas or air through it. I'm not really sure how they make it, but you end up with these little um, stones really made out of glass that look a bit like honeycomb. And um, the brilliant thing about glass is it's really strong in compression. So um, you fill the whole space with this um, recycled glass after you've put a membrane, mem membrane down and then you um, press it down and it, it's strong, but it's also insulation at the same time. So it's doing the structure and the insulation work in one. And then on top of that, we've got a lime um, screed, lime based screed. So it's breathable um, with underfloor heating in it and then a slate floor on top. So when we started work, we took the roof off, of course, took, a, took out all of the timber in the, in the middle on the floor that was all uh, rotting and collapsed and scraped it all back to this soil inside. And then the membrane went down and the recycled glass went on top. Um, and we saved the ridge tiles. We had to get new slates because you, you saw before they were all bashed, but we wanted to keep these nice uh, ridge tiles. Uh, we use one piece of steel here across uh, to support the mezzanine because we couldn't do it in timber it would have been far too enormous and then uh, we st you can see here look you see this piece of timber that's coming down and that's the first piece for the roof and the next two pieces will come on so the, the final one will poke out the outside so we put in some drainage there's the recycled glass on top of the membrane and then we took all that awful cement render off the outside and repointed it with lime render so it could breathe <laughs> And then it ended up like this at the end with the store with a moss roof. I've always wanted to do a moss roof and I was delighted that I could uh, because normally when you look for moss roofs on online, it's just all about how to get rid of moss. Um, this is a little hidden ventilation uh, for the air that's coming in um, rather than a big pipe. 
and that's what it looked like inside when we were building it. The water comes off the hill into a big tank and into the storeroom where it's filtered with a UV filter and different le levels of sand. And we have a magical heat exchanger in the middle um, behind, uh, behind a cupboard in the bathroom, which is taking in the fresh air and exchanging the heat so we're not losing any heat. It looks like that behind, once. that was um, what it looked like before we tiled. And then there's a big mirror there that goes there now, which you can take off if you need to get to the heat exchanger. Um, and that's the store which was inspired by um, local agricultural buildings down the road, a nice kind of rusting corrugated steel um, hidden door. And that's the view for when you stick your head out of the window in the uh, on the mezzanine where the bed is. So it looks like that. I haven't been there yet because of COVID. It's been quite hard work um, doing this without being able to go and visit. And there was no Wi-Fi. So the builder, the builder had to have a lot of information on the drawings because he couldn't just ring us up from there. There was no phone reception either. So um, that's the little cup kitchen area with um, the door through to the um, bedroom and then the bathrooms on the other side. It's all lime plastered and that's where it started and that's um, where it is at the moment. We've still got to do the landscaping, but um, probably get on with that in the spring. Um, I just thought I'd add this, which is um, from an article I read yesterday in The Economist which says, if the cement industry were a country, it would be the third largest emitter in the world after China and America. Um, not so sure about this image. It's making concrete look amazing. All the butterflies and the flowers are gathering. Um, I just think it's just an interesting thing to end with because it's quite positive about um, concrete when um, I'm not really that positive about concrete. Hopefully the, you know, the mix will eventually improve, but at the moment concrete, I would say, is a no-go. Okay. Thank you very much. That was that was a lovely presentation, uh, and I think you ended pretty nicely with uh, concrete, especially that Angela is going to now talk about uh, concrete. And yeah, I'm going to let let Angela speak now. Nicely done. Okay, so yeah, thanks Anna for that really insightful talk um, on natural materials. I think some pressing issues raised around some of the trade-offs we make and the slow-moving nature of the industry. Um, so I'm going to turn my attention now to a material that's pervasive in the built environment, and that's concrete, love it or hate it. Uh, I'm taking it as an extreme case because uh, I want to examine the trade-offs that we need to make in terms of materials that you might choose in your projects. Above all, I'm basing it um, on a conversation that I kept having with myself last year around should we just do the really radical thing and ban the use of concrete in student projects at the MSA debate. Um, we can maybe come back to that at the end. So concrete's been around since the Roman period, but it just took off during the Industrial Revolution and accelerated through the late 20th century. So here concrete becomes intertwined with the rampant fossil fuel emissions increases that we, we see in that period too. And just another statistic to end on um, Anna's one, if we laid out all of the cement ever produced, it would form a two centimetre thick crust around the earth. So we'll start here, we'll begin with the contribution of concrete to carbon emissions in the built environment. So anyone that's heard me speak before will know that, you know, anything between 35 to 45% of our carbon emissions comes from the built environment, depending upon how you measure things. And a lot of that is because of all cement production in concrete. So in terms of the total building stock, which is on my left, so A, the graph A, um, construction and maintenance and new constructions is significantly larger than existing buildings. If we go to B and look at um, one building, we can see that almost 40% of that is due to concrete. So that's the red bit of the, the, the graph at the bottom. Um, by far and away, the biggest contributor to concrete carbon emissions is um, cement production around 75%, so you see that in uh, graph C with the pig, pig, peachy bit in the middle. Um, and that's down to a number of issues. So if you look into one cement bag, um, there's a few reasons for that, but the biggest contributor is mainly due to limestone decarbonation, which is when limestone, which is calcium carbonate, is heated with clays to create calcium oxide. And as a byproduct, roughly 600 kilograms of carbon dioxide is released for every tonne of cement produced. 
Now, around 50% of the produced cement goes into making concrete. And it's a large scale use of concrete, which means that as a material, it represents a significantly large proportion of global carbon emissions. Concrete then and how it accumulates in the Earth's crust is one of the markers of the, of the Anthropocene, a potential geological time period that marks the point where human activity significantly impacted upon the Earth's climate and ecology. For some analysts, it's simply not feasible to replace this material within the next decade, and just because of the way that we have um, weaned ourselves or have became dependent upon it. Because concrete after water is one of the main items that's helped humans to urbanize. It's great at keeping the elements away from a building and it's arguably the most widely used man-made material in the construction industry. It's used in almost everything from water and waste systems or energy systems or transportation networks in our homes. And it's also what a rather conservative and risk-averse construction industry are used to using. Construction workers know how to how to use concrete, right? Concrete is also beautiful. Okay, I'd be doing a disservice to my lifetime membership of the Manchester Modern Society if I didn't say that actually, you know, I do like looking at concrete buildings. I love, I'm kind of, I'm on a um, conversion as well. It's probably a little bit of nostalgia due to where I grew up, which is entirely post-war city. Um, but, you know, it's an argument that people often make, you know, the concrete allows you to do things. And here we've got, um, Bosco and Almeida buildings in Brasilia, concrete's versatile on the right hand, it can become art. So the architectural historian Barnabas Calder, who's, also, who's the author of Raw Concrete, has also began to reappraise the contributions of architecture through the lens of its energy use. It still high, highlights the power that concrete has to ins, um, inspire us. Concrete's also resilient. For many countries around the world, which are already subject to extreme heat and floods, um, concrete is a cheap and easily available material that can help them to rebuild. Concrete is water resistant and it's much easier to dry out properties that are predominantly made of, of, of concrete over and above other substances. Its versatility and resilience means that concrete is often seen as, a, as useful in helping us to build climate resilient infrastructure. Concrete is also durable. It lasts for a long time. So one argument that's often made in favour of its, its continued use is that in terms of embodied carbon, while its initial costs are high, a concrete building can pay back the carbon over the longer term when compared to other materials. I don't quite buy this argument, but the more durable it is, so this, the argument goes, the better the potential carbon emissions that can be achieved. Concrete buildings also have a high thermal mass. They absorb and store heat. And so in certain applications could potentially reduce the operational carbon associated with a building in use. So the arguments go. The durability argument is an interesting one when we think about two aspects of climate change. One is the need to mitigate carbon emissions and cut our costs in half by 2050. The other is the very real need to adapt to the changing climate. And the two are often considered separately. So warming temperatures and increased precipitation may mean that reinforced concrete in particular might suffer from more rapid deterioration leading to higher rates of maintenance and replacement over over time or certainly more than what, what people think. There's a lot of research into these issues, um, some quite exciting stuff that's going on, particularly around the use of effective microbes and helping to prolong concrete's durability and strength. So I'm going to leave that one as an open question. Concrete's cheap. Any of the students that have undertaken my BA2 humanities course will know that whilst countries such as China, India and Brazil may be amongst the highest emitters now, they were not in the past that accolade goes to the US and Europe um, with their huge cumulative historic emissions. And this raises issues of justice. Can we really dictate to developing countries um, that they should not use concrete when they sometimes see it as essential to development and when they perhaps do not have the resources to investigate other ways of building? Uh, which is why I quite like this quote here, which talks about our. Um, the responsibility of developed countries to um, perhaps um, make the financial resources and technology available. Because the kinds of you, again, rests on investigating promise of natural materials. Um, developing countries currently use about 80 to 90% of the world's um, steel reinforced concrete. Uh, however, very few of these nations have the ability or resources to produce their own steel or cement, which means that they're in potentially exploitative import relationships with developed countries to obtain steel and concrete. 
So I want to come back to the issue of embodied carbon. So that's a huge amount of carbon that's already been emitted in production of concrete structures that we already have. The image here shows the Grand Park in Bordeaux, excuse my um, French pronunciation, refurbished by Lacaton and Vassal, the winners of the 2021 Pritzker Prize for Architecture. Here they renovated three social housing buildings originally designed in the early 1960s, total of 530 dwellings. Yes, concrete was used in the replacement of some parts, prefabricated and poured directly into the foundations, but the use was minimised through the choice of reusing the existing structure, which is characteristic of their work. The greenest building is the one that is already built. So, in conclusion, I want to emphasise that I am in no way being pro-concrete. I'm not arguing for concrete. However, it's a good and extreme case to demonstrate the multitude of issues that we need to, to um, think about when weighing up decisions about what materials to use, things that are perhaps not so much black and white as what we think they are. There are choices to make and sometimes the wider industry might inhibit our, our ambitions. Even timber, material loaded for its ability to, to suck carbon out of the atmosphere can, can be used unwisely. The benefits of trees are well evidenced, um, but not if those trees are planted in the wrong places or as a monoculture, which can destroy biodiversity, which is what we see in, in the production of palm oil. So yes, concrete's environmental credentials are dubious, no matter what the concrete industry can claims. And yes, there are moves towards reducing the carbon emissions, emissions associated with cement and concrete production, but those are probably not fast enough um, to help us meet anything near our 2050 targets. And so I think it comes down to our behaviour and attitudes towards materials and concrete in particular. So we need to ask whether we need to build at all. And we need to look at whether we can use existing structures and investigate the, the possibilities of using existing materials and thinking about future recyclability. Again, there have been recent improvements with, in con with for concrete in this regard. And this can actually help us to be really creative in what we do with our existing structures and think about that already in body carbon in the built environment. So I'd urge you to be careful to use less to explore alternatives and where you must use concrete, be very careful in your justification for that. But I also came to the conclusion that you need to know how to work with concrete if you are it, to be able to reappraise and reuse the existing structures that we have, which represent a massive amount of embodied carbon. And so to answer my original question, I concluded that we couldn't ban concrete in student projects, but I'm hoping that I can use this platform to debate that further. Thanks. Thank you very much for this presentation. I think it's an invoking a lot of thoughts and I just love the contrast between the, uh, the natural materials and the presentation and then you have the concrete. And I think like this sort of leads to more questions about if we have the possibility of replacing concrete and such in a way unsustainable material with natural materials, then wh why doesn't it happen now? Like if we, if we have it right there, what is happening? Why? Who would you like to answer? I, I think it would be great to have an answer from both of you. Okay, um, I would, there's lots of reasons. I'd say people are really comfy with the things they know. It's um, new things, people worry about new things. There's a fear of the unknown. Um, there's a lack of testing of everything, like in terms of long term. Although 800 year old buildings are made of this stuff. So it's kind of funny the, that we, we need the paperwork and the certificates, but we still have quite a lot of it already in existence. Um, and I think there aren't people skilled in it. I think we need to be teaching people in colleges how to build with this stuff. Um, and also it's at the moment, until until there's a tip, it's, ge it's generally, um, well, actually it's, it depends on who you talk to, but it's sometimes more expensive but it's not always more expensive. So I just think it's it, there's a, it's multiple, multiple layered answer really, dep depending on, how, you could go off in all directions on that one in terms of being brave to have a go, I think as well. I, I think that might make sense, especially like uh -huh, Angela mentioned that concrete is, is cheap, but at the same time there comes a price and it is always like up to money in the end, but, there but is should, always but is it is it always up to money? I mean, I know it is because that's the system in which we base ourselves. But 
uh, if you think about a lot of the things that we do every day, we don't get paid for, but it's still work. It's, it's how we value things, isn't it? And when you say concrete is mm -hmm. cheap, I actually wrote that down. In what way are you measuring cheap? Because if life is important, then I would say that concrete is expensive. Yeah, you're right. But mm -hmm. it tends to be uh, governments and industry tend to yeah. take everything down to its economic cost. Um, I was just thinking about the issue with building regs. I remember reading about, um, you know, our, our current building regulations are pretty much developed through the industrial revolution and in response to that. So they tend, they tend to kind of um, be more oriented towards materials that were used um, predominantly from that time period. So I've heard things like planners can be a little bit unsure if um, somebody comes with say something like straw bale, which actually paradoxically was in use for centuries long before the industrial revolution then fell out of favor. Um, but now people are bringing it back, but there's perhaps some issues with um, kind of fears around um, you know, the building regs not being able to kind of let planners and stuff properly appraise them. Yeah. So lots of things need to change. Yeah, they do. Uh, one of the etc. Regulations, etc. Definitely, one of the things, one of the aims of the Natural Materials Group is to try and get building regulations to include standard details of natural materials. Because if you look in, um, you know, part L, the standard details are just all concrete blocks and bricks, and that's not the only option. Yep. Um, I also think like just. Uh, uh, and Angela's uh, presentation, you mentioned how how it's really nice and aesthetic. And I think that also, sort of in a way, for some people it's a it's a good thing. But some people think it's even though it looks nice, it's not natural, and we should build in a more natural way. And that, in a way, also goes with the building regulations, as in. Uh, they sort of in a way tell you how to design they give you the ideas the basic ideas that's at least what i think uh maybe i'm wrong so <laughs> if if any of you have any better ideas um and tell me that i'm wrong that i'm more than eager to hear <laughs> i was thinking of when you were speaking there um i was thinking that statement i made about concrete being kind of beautiful can be beautiful um for a long time people didn't think that <laughs> you know when they I think back to things around the modern site, they, they were trying to um, kind of raise this appreciation, appreciation of the concrete built environment. So people's attitudes to materials can change. So I think sometimes there's a feeling that natural materials are a bit unfinished and this and that, but those attitudes can change the more that you show examples and examples like Anna's, which, you know, I don't think there's maybe enough. I think also though, it's got a lot to do with design this because if you design a really beautiful building if you get the shape and the form right i mean obviously it's intrinsically linked to the materials that you cho choose but you can have a staggeringly beautiful building made out of concrete and one that's also not very nice at all and it's to do with how you've designed it as well and so that's where we have responsibility and so it's it's not just about the materials it's about how we're using them and if we're good designers and um, yeah it's 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 a tricky one it's 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 a combination of a lot of things and that's what makes it quite interesting to talk about yeah do, do you also like think that maybe in the future it might change how we use concrete or in general how it can be again substituted in a way uh, for example there are developments with concrete which actually absorbs carbon from the air rather than <laughs> emit it uh, during the production and, and things like that. Do you think that has like a future uh, or not really? Um, I'm just, I mean, there's, there's quite a few ideas for how you might um, decarbonize uh, cement production in particular in concrete. So things around carbon capture and storage and um, using biomass or even human waste materials. Um, but from some of the figures that I've seen, I've read a few papers around this, um, that's probably that it's not going to happen by 2050. 
And if we think about what our net zero carbon targets are, yeah, it's probably not going to happen um, fast enough, um, is what I would say. So, you know, we also, I think like carbon emissions, we're not going to stop the use of concrete immediately. And, and it's great that there's moves towards decarbonizing it, but we really need to use much, 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 much less of it. I think I think the point you made, Angela, about the fact that you just shouldn't really build anything. I know we're all, you know we're teaching new architecture and you're all learning how to design. And we're saying right, the most important thing is don't design or build anything. But actually, that if we don't, and that that means that you work with the existing buildings and do lots of retrofit, and it's not pretty and it's fiddly. But I think there's that's a massive shift that we need to take on board is that you work with an existing and reuse it rather than um, uh, knock something down and start again, which is just really wasteful in in many ways. Um, yeah. But with with that idea, sometimes you have for, there are buildings which are designed in a really bad way in which they can be really not sustainable, but the materials can be taken from them for the and repurposed. Do you think that would have a bit more like an idea to it that maybe yeah. after all there is a way to knock a building down and place a new one but by reusing the materials and and trying to create something new from what once was there yeah i mean uh, rome rome is full of that you know there's loads of bits of rome that are just missing and rebuilt and and it's it's amazing we we think oh it's really sad that they took this down and we can't see it but actually it was great they just moved it into another place and made something else with it so yeah i think there's definitely a valid way to 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 use what we've already got but um i think going back to the the concrete and the car, I mean, it's all about cement. The main, the main problem with concrete is, is that the, you have to heat calcium carbonate to 1400 degrees in a kiln. And that's the problem. And the fact, so you've got to, you've got to find that heat from somewhere and then it releases carbon dioxide in the process. So you've got kind of two issues there, lots of heat and then lots of carbon dioxide. So there's lots of people in, in doing interesting things like creating concrete with bacteria bind, binders. In that YouTube video, they they show some of that. And then, you know, adding graphene so that you, you use less because it's stronger. So there's just less of it because it doesn't need to be so thick. Um, and capturing the carbon dioxide in, in big kind of tanks. And then when you mix the concrete on site, you inject the carbon dioxide back into the wet mix so it's kind of trapped there as it's um setting um which is all great and really industrious and clever but i would agree with angela that we just need to use less of it in the first place because all of that stuff is going to be just creating a lot of energy it's just gets it's getting fiddly isn't it it's like trying to make this thing work it's a, it's a similar to nuclear power in the fact that nu nuclear power is amazing. It's absolutely amazing, apart from the waste. And there's a, that's the argument about nuclear power is the, the fact that we struggle with, well, what do we do with all this waste? And currently, <clears throat> you just dig a big, massive hole and put it in the ground and cover it with concrete and tell no one, tell everyone to keep away from it. So it's, it's just knowing how, yeah, I would say try not to use concrete as much as possible, if at all. But um, the cost of other materials makes it difficult. But in the same way that when you're choosing, you know, food to buy, you can buy something really cheap, which is lacking in nutrition, or you can get something that maybe is more expensive and better for you. Mm. It's, it's that's what I was meaning by positioning, really. What what position are you going to take? Yeah, yeah that, no, I think that that is a really good point. Mm. It makes saying how to how to approach the science in the future um but yeah um we also know that there are yeah as we could see in our presentation that, that there are different materials and it always comes to this of the choice that you make whether you make it go for an effective i mean not effective but economic approach and for example use concrete without thinking about the environment and the, what comes with it or think, whether you think about yeah no go on or whether you think or whether you, you, you choose a, a, a more sustainably sourced material mm -hmm. and a material which makes smaller impact on the environment. But with that also obviously comes more ideas such as the carbon footprint, because sometimes you can have 
tinder for your structure which is coming all the way from the other side of the world and yeah. is that sustainable then if it emits carbon and makes the situation even worse i think i think um the <sighs> What you have to realize is it's not really simple and it's not really easy and architecture involves so many different factors and you have to navigate through all of them making decisions and then that that's what you end up with so for example using recycled foam glass in that as the foundation st and structure and insulation together um a friend of mine was winding me up saying but it's it, you have to use so much energy to melt the glass um that you should have just used concrete but then but then also the bags are really light so the builders i just found it really easy to use and so they didn't go home with really sore backs in the evening i mean it depends on how you think about it they just get a knife cut the bag open tip it in get the next one the bags are so light and they really enjoyed using it because it was just easy for them so it, it depends on how you're thinking and measuring really it's complicated Thing. I remember from uh, one reading that we had last year given by Angela about wasting, um, I mean, waste created, I think it was in Hong Kong, and uh, how you got timber structures, uh, like a lot of timber actually gets wasted during the construction process, uh, and that also creates waste, so it's exactly, I was surprised by it, so I totally understand what you're saying now, that it's a lot of things coming into architecture with things like that yeah but uh, then you could use the, you know if you use the timber you could then turn it into wood fiber because that insulation because you just turn it into sawdust yeah that is a great solution <laughs> yeah i'm assuming that's know. where they they get their timber from all the offcuts from somewhere to make that yeah Hugh, do you think it's time to maybe open the question now because we've got a lot of questions in the chats i do yeah. we yeah so Excellent. Hugh did you want to to was there anything you kind of wanted to say to wrap up because we're going to come back to you at sort of 20 past for a bit of a wrapping up session so would you be happy to move over to Carlin who's been pulling together some yeah. of the student questions okay thank you guys that was absolutely outstanding and I'll just hand over to Carlin now who's been pulling together some of the questions on the chat perfect thank you you're on mute yeah. oh. <laughs> Can you all hear me all right? We're getting feedback. It was actually better when Dan's mic was on. Let's try now. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Perfect, perfect. So as Dan said, I've been gathering questions in the background silently. So we'll prioritize student questions, and I think we're going to create a really interesting discussion. So the first one that I'm really interested in asking you both is, in practice, is the continuing use of concrete slash high energy materials mostly driven by architects, contractors, or clients? And if it's a cost-based choice to keep using high energy materials and building methods, how can we make it more attractive to use higher cost but, low, but lower energy materials? This is from Philippa. It's a question for, for both of you. Do you want to go first on it? Like, <laughs> I was actually interested in how you managed to persuade your client to go for natural materials. Or maybe that's yeah, I guess. Um, <clears throat> well, could I, uh, so um, again, it's a difficult one. Sometimes you get clients who are really up for it. Others, others you don't. Uh, I would say um, it's about education we need to educate clients and we need to educate developers um developers just see it, it's all about the money they want you know how much money am i making how many flats can i put in here so if something's it's actually construction used you know deals in millions of pounds but the margins are actually super tight so um any savings they will make as much as they possibly can so it does make it difficult and then I mean, it gets really complicated because it could also to be to do with contracts if you use um, a traditional contract then you have more power as an architect if you use a design and build then the um the contractor can offer suggestions and alternatives to the client and say look if you use this it's cheaper and invariably the client will say yeah okay i'll use that one um but for the prod for the little chapel that i did um the first thing was you know it was all 
rigid insulation and we'll just whack some concrete in here and and i um you know the, the i kind of made myself a challenge which was we won't use any mastic you know the stuff that goes around the bath um um and you put it uh, builders will always put it in the corners of bathrooms because they they worried that the corner will move a bit so and crack so they don't they like to just put mastic down the corner which we said no don't do that it was it was interesting the builder the builder had a lot to learn from doing it too um but i don't really know how i persuaded them i just kind of think i said no you're not doing it like that <laughs> i think it was <clears throat> confidently uh <laughs> A confident dictator in with a smile or something i'm not really sure but I, I i just kind of got on board when i said look it's a really old building it's 500 meters thick the cement on the outside is not good it needs to have a natural moisture point in the wall but you know where it will get a bit damp and it will dry out and we need to let the building breathe um it doesn't mean it's, it's still airtight but it breathes so um it's it's i'm not sure if i'm answering your question really but um does that help? I've just realised I know you as well. It's nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know that's useful. I was just thinking because, like, um, I know there was um, there's a the physicians building in Liverpool that originally their concept had been to be like um, timber structure, and then it just ended up being a glass and steel and concrete right. huge building. So, like, that's the sort of thing. Like, sometimes you can go into a project with like a a really like natural material like driven idea and it just gets like value engineered out and like i think we need to become more confident yeah. you need to be more confident in that and just um try and actually work out the sums for it you know if you really believe in something say well let me see let me see the details how much is it and I'd, i had a project like that once where they i wanted to use recycled glass floor slabs uh, like like big paving kind of 600 square and um, the quantity surveyor who, you know, does all the costing and measuring on a job um, just said, no, it's too expensive. So I rang up the company and I got all the costs and I did a whole spreadsheet and sent it to him. And so then we got we got it because mm -hmm. he couldn't. I think it was because he couldn't be bothered to try to work it out because it's more time for them rather than just looking in their standard schedule of this material equals this much. Yeah. Right, moving on. Perfect. Uh, thank you very much. Anna, there is another question for you, actually, it was from Rachel. So <clears throat> I was, I mean, we were wondering if you see the market fully embracing the mycelium uh, growing bricks, for example, in the near future. Um, would be good. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. Let's just say, let's hope that they that it yeah people get a bit more excited and a bit more experimental with this stuff. But it's expensive, isn't it? You know, you build some on a house; it's all their entire life savings. So they th there's that risk that they have to take, not necessarily financially, but also mentally. I think. Okay. Yep. Uh, thank you. So again, I I want to build a bit upon what you were talking about previously about concrete actually it was helen who kind of asked something very interesting helen could you please come in and ask your question it was about the architecture historians yes i, I was trying i've asked a couple of questions i couldn't remember what it no, was I know. No, it's fine colin sorry i was sending a text at the same time as well which is really bad i do apologize <laughs> um my question was is the kind of glorification of uh, which kind of goes back to Hugh's like well concrete's beautiful kind of line <laughs> sorry Hugh um is it because the historians and the architectural historians are telling us that story of how beautiful and how amazing concrete is but never doing the the, the kind of the lens of the green lens of architectural history which there is there is books that that tell that story I know because I worked on them years ago, but there are books there are um, articles that that tell us that story and that narrative and I think I, I believe that that maybe should come into our history courses as well, as well as the kind of current issues. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think there's been a shift in. Um... In, in architectural history towards this I think last year's site of architectural. I always get it mixed up. 
the Architectural Historians of Great Britain, SAHGB, um, it was dedicated to yeah. the climate crisis and stuff. So I think that's changing. I think it's in general a move away from seeing architectural history as and it's kind of reliance on art history to moving into slightly different directions, which is positive. And I think, um, you know, yeah, definitely will be making more of an appearance in our history and theory courses. Simple. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we wanted to follow up on some student questions. Uh, will be Seth and then Catalina. Maybe if you are there, you might want to unmute yourself and turn your camera on to ask yours. Seth, Seth you are asking about something about shifting the mentality away, if you're here. Um, I just wanted to know where, what your honest opinion on um, was about whether you think it's, there's any shifts that are going to come at all, like big shifts to both both people. Thanks. Shift. Do you, do you mean shift in how we design or what we shift use towards the material uh, and the way concrete? Yeah. Yeah, I'm really hoping there is. I'm really, really hoping there will be. Um, it's all it's all down to legislation. I think there's a lot of legislation that needs to change. Um, you know, VAT on on buildings, things like that. Um, it, it, this is multi multi action points required really which is why I think ACAN if you look on their website has nine different groups because there's quite a lot of really important things that need to be uh, kind of investigated and, and pushed so that we can um, do this. I, I went to a really interesting um, launch last week um, in um, Yorkshire it was like Every, just all the people at the top in Yorkshire have commissioned um, a kind of survey of how we can grow hemp in Yorkshire and what we can make with it and how many factories and where we where they would put the factories so that they, they didn't, you know, the um, transportation distances aren't that far. You know, they were really working it out. It was quite incredible, really, that I think we should all just go move to Yorkshire, really. Um, they just seem to be... <laughs> Um, miles ahead in their thinking and uh, <laughs> there you go and um, yeah just really it was really inspiring um, they were doing the sums and they had the graphs and the diagrams and they were trying to work out how many houses they could make and they were actually working it they were doing it financially as well how much it would cost to make a factory how much it would cost to grow this stuff and how they could fit it in between food crops because it grows really quickly so they're not really taking over the food crop space and um, they could make these boards and then they had a specialist who was talking about who makes the boards down south near Bristol somewhere talking about how he could help them set up the factories and uh, yeah it was really amazing actually so I do feel it, it's coming but I'm not sure who's leading without getting into politics and who's leading and who leads who leads the country it feels like that there's, there's a real up up upwards pressure from a lot of people and we're almost getting ahead of the leaders okay uh cool so then um catalina also asked an interesting question catalina if you're there would you mind turning on your camera and ask your question so your microphone thank you Colleen. Um, my question is directed to Anna, but it can also be answered by Angela, of course. Uh, I saw you mentioned some natural materials that can be used usually when building. And I was wondering if clay is actually a feasible material to build with in the UK, considering the weather and humidity. Yes. <laughs> there you go. Short answer question. Um, yeah clay the, the clay that i showed you is a plaster so it's just the layer that's on the outside uh, on the inside um but building with earth um, yeah you can build buildings with earth in this country there are thousands of them around the country it's just that we don't really get taught about them or they're mostly houses but um they're you know there are eight story i saw a couple of eight story buildings what well, i think one's in germany and one's in france and they're 300 years old and they're made of earth so it is possible it's just that we don't um, we, we've got obsessed with the fact that the wall thickness means that there's less um, area inside. So the, the thickness of a wall um, affects how much a building can be sold for because it's all about the square meterage of the space inside. 
so it, it it's yeah it's that's what um i think perhaps puts people off or maybe the problem is that normally you have to just work with the material that's near you so it's not as easy to make a factory and make millions of pounds from it because you're just using the materials near where your building is and you're just digging digging the hole in the ground so um, a big company like british gypsum can't really um take over that because it's not um, a standardized material thank you and, and angela we were wondering do you have anything to complement this with what is your view on this That's not uh, the next question. Okay. okay. Yeah. Do you need for a second? It looks like Angela went out the room for a minute uh, or lost her connection. So she's probably just back in. So let's move to the next question, which I think is from Becky. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the talks. Uh, Anna and Angela, they were great. Um, I think actually Philippa covered a bit of uh, what I was asking. So, um, I'll kind of slightly rephrase my question. I guess I'm thinking about my own experiences in trying to use more sustainable building materials when I was refurbishing my house. And the problem that I came across was finding contractors who were confident and knowledgeable enough to actually work with these things. And for some for some of the things I was trying to do, I actually ended up giving up because I just couldn't find anyone to use a more natural material. I just wondered if you'd come across that um Anna yeah definitely we we um we started when we well in the house that I'm in now it's it's old and it should really be lime plaster on the walls because that's what they were built that's how they were built and it means that they, they can breathe um they're not insulated though that's the only that's the problem with old houses is the lack of insulation but they're they're great in terms of what they're made from um and we got someone in to do lime plastering and they she it was she had no idea she was like i've never used this stuff and she was like getting the mix wrong and it was falling off the wall and she she was really pleased though when she got the hang of it but um it cost us a fortune so we didn't do it on the other other walls in the house which is a real shame because we just we just um because because we're not plaster replastering all of the house, some of the walls are fine anyway. So then he was just we then thought, what are we doing? What's the point of repairing it? How has it used to be when that wall we're not going to touch is going to just stay with cement in it anyway? So, um, but in the chapel, just going back to that, the um, the it's lime it's lime plastered, and after they finished, they shut the door and went off, and then they came back two weeks later, and there was mold everywhere because lime plaster is really damp and you have to le let it takes longer to dry out because it it requires more water so we got um what they call those condensing kind of air units on the go to suck all the air out um and it's it's okay now we we rang the company and said ah <laughs> and they said it's okay you'll be able to paint over it you won't see it you just need to let it dry out and it's it's the it's the builder probably not reading the instructions on the packet you know like when you get a new something it always comes with the book that you think oh, i'll read that but you never do and then eventually it just goes in the recycling it's that it's that um being aware of the thing that you're using so i think a lot of builders need to be skilled up with it i, I do worry about that i think if we're doing lots of retrofit in the future that will end up with lots of moldy buildings if we're not careful I think as well, just to add that there's, there's been moves um, throughout. So um, there's something called the Climate Framework, which was done by a cross-industry action group um, led by Mina Hasman. Um, and it's precisely aimed at developing um, support and educational materials and so on for across the entire construction industry, because you know, we're kind of focused on architect well, I'm focused on architectural education, but it's precisely that point. If you don't have people who can work with these things then you know it, it causes an issue and it's probably why concrete is still widely used thanks both perfect thank you very much and was in, an interesting comment from emily previously she said it was lovely to see all these uh, details for using these types of materials so i want to kind of build up on that i was thinking to ask both of you how how can we make make students want to use these more natural materials 
uh, in their detailing rather than the common ones. Because you know, if you go into a detailing magazine, you kind of see a lot of usual like concrete buildings and stuff like that. So it's easier for them to find these details, but how can we make them use more natural materials? Um, I think there's something to be said for um, more give, provide more experience for you to, to go and look and touch and see and feel these materials. I think it's yeah. particularly relevant in the past year where you've been mostly stuck in your houses due to COVID. Yeah, I would agree. I was thinking about that the other day, thinking it would be great to have um, a materials library, but maybe not just a materials library, but build ups so you can see the layers and actually understand it. But, um, it, you know, that's quite a big undertaking, isn't it? Because there are so many different options out there. Um, I think I think you're right. If you go to Detail Inspiration online, for example, most of the stuff is uh, is traditional but um when you're an architect what you do is you you find the company that supplies the material and then you send them a sketch and then they you know help you with the detail so for example in the with the wood fiber insulation on that roof the company said oh you don't need a membrane but we put one he said you can put one in if you want because the client will probably be, be a bit too um, surprised about that and they'll probably want one anyway for to feel safe but actually it does if a bit of rain gets into that into the wood fiber it will just evaporate out eventually as long as the tiles are put on properly there's not going to be an issue with water coming through but we put a membrane on anyway so um yeah i'm not i'm not sure what natural um i'll let you know when the natural materials group has made the, all their standard natural materials details I'm not doing that. I'm just watching and thinking they're all amazing. These people with lots of energy. Um. Wonderful. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think I think Helen wants to to come build up on that, right? Yeah. There's you know to any student in this space that is getting excited about making and building, I would I would look at the Center for Alternative Technology yeah. as well as a space to go and have fun and learn about rammed earth and do some rammed earth and make some cob walls and accept, build with straw bale. And there's loads of really accessible and affordable courses there. And then you go to the most amazing, magical fantasy land in McConlith in Mid Wales. And it's just fab. And it's about getting your hands dirty and trying it and making mistakes and realizing that it's hard, but actually learning loads and loads. And I would absolutely advocate lots of that happening if you can. Yeah. Can, oh, I was just going to say um, as well, because um, I've really enjoyed this and we're probably getting towards the end of, of the discussion. But um, students, you know, if there's anything you want to see or want to see in your education or want me to do as a climate change leader for school, come directly to me. Go through, join the MSSA Climate Action Group, and yeah, just just keep on at us. I think. Okay, so um, Hubert, I think it's a good Hubert, it's a good moment for you to mention that you're part of the Climate Action Group. You may have done it at the beginning, but just just do it again and plug that a little bit, and then maybe just a little bit of summary of your thoughts as a discussant. And then uh, I'll take the floor back off you after three or four minutes and just announce next week's final uh, three week run of uh, climate action in relation to COP. Um, so over to you, Hugh. Yep, thank you. Um, I, I, yeah, um, I'm the co lead of the uh, MSA Climate Action Group. All right. And um, I think this whole presentation and the discussion that we had was really useful not only to me, but I think many students uh, about the materials and to think about materials in a different way, not only that uh, there is just a deeper meaning to them than what only we see and feel, because there is the whole aspect of the of uh, how it's sourced and things like that. Right. Um, and I think, yeah, that is a very important thing which we often seem to forget. And that's sort of what we need in our group. Uh, that's what our group is about, to make us aware 
about such things. Um, during our meetings, we, we have discussions sometimes about, yeah, exactly things like materials or just way of, of constructing, I mean, yeah, the process of construction and things like that. And uh, yeah, I think it was a wonderful discussion to just underline that actually material matters and it's not only what it looks and what you can touch, but it's so much more than just that. Thank you. I think exactly as Helen was starting to, I think a big round of applause and appreciation for our speakers and for you, you tonight. So um, really a warm mic. I'm gonna share, thank you. I'm gonna share my screen and God knows what will come up when I do share it, let's find out. Um, but just to put next week's poster up, there's all sorts of things open, but hopefully um, we can, this thing's in the way, so I can't quite do it. How's it gone? This is not good. Here we go. There it is. Hooray. Okay, Angela, tell us a little bit about next week. So it'd be nice if you connected this to, to COP26. You know, we've done a, this is a three week run coinciding with COP26. This is who we'll have next week. Over to you. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so obviously COP26 is going on and we're getting all sorts of, um, uh, proclamations coming out from the great and the good of nations around the world. So this talk from Simon Sturgis is um, going to be looking at architecture and carbon and what 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 do we need to do to meet these kind of big targets that are coming out. Um, he's part of something called Targeting Zero, which is a consultancy, and um, he's been advising all sorts of people from REBA to Rex to the UK Green Building Council. Um, He's the author of, of a book called Targeting Zero. It's published through the RIBA as well. So I think he's going to he's going to relate back to COP twenty six. He's going to try to be slightly provocative, and he's going to get us all thinking about how we meet meet these targets. Unmute. Here we go. So that's it for tonight, everybody. Thank you very much. Um, please tell all your friends and colleagues about next week's. The inspiration series, like provocations, there's just six of them per year. They're spread out three or four weeks apart. And this one, we're able to invite these speakers because uh, Fosters and Partners have kindly sponsored it. So we've got money to invite these international speakers. So uh, be really good um, next week. Well done. Uh, and thank you, Angela, for that invitation. Did you mention who the discussant was? Um, that we've got Laura Simonson, I think that's oh, what sorry, I forgot. who's the other co lead of the um, MSSA Climate Action Group. So, brilliant. We'll see you all at the same time next Thursday. Thank you very much. And in particular, Anna, we look forward to welcoming you in the school in the new year. Thank you again, Angela, and top job, Hugh and Carlin again. So, good night and thank you all. <laughs>